Today we are going to conclude the little mini-series we began, began a few weeks ago. We have looked at many, many passages of Scripture in our last two studies together. We considered the 10th chapter of Acts and Peter's vision of the sheet being let down and saw that even Peter did not understand this vision at first. Yet so many today attempt to force an incorrect meaning uh, to this with only a superficial reading of that chapter. We saw that in several verses in that 10th chapter that the meaning was explained and the issue was not pigs or any other animal but people. And that what was being taught was that bigotry and prejudice are strongly condemned by God. We further spent some time in the 11th chapter of Leviticus and saw all of these various animals on land, the waters, and in the air that God said could and could not be used as food. And we further saw in Genesis that this distinction existed all the way back at the time of the flood, way before Moses ever came on the scene. We also have spent some time seeing that God has said he will not alter or change that which he has said. And yet the corrupted higher critics have tampered with God's word in, in Mark. And in addition to the omission totally of verse 16 of Mark 7, they've added words without warrant or without warning. And the reader is simply misled into believing that they are a part of the inspired words of the Apostle Mark. I even shared with you some quotations where they declared that, I quote, by the change of a single letter in a Greek, a new reading is gained. And now the verse concludes, this he said, declaring all foods clean. They admit openly, we changed it, we made it say what we wanted to say. Another passage we considered was in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter in the first five verses, which again is one that some twist in an attempt to justify eating that which God has forbidden. However, as we saw in this passage, it has nothing to do with clean and unclean foods, but rather Paul is arguing against the fanaticism and monasticism that teaches the material creation is evil, and the pious must live an isolated, celibate life, assisting on meager and bland diets. We also went to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, written a year before the book of Romans, where Paul had dealt with the same problems of diet and weak brothers and Christian love. And then, of course, we spent a lot of time the last time we were together um, in a passage that has been tremendously twisted from its context by many today and has been used by some to disparage a vegetarian diet and to negate the distinction between clean and unclean foods and also to abolish the Sabbath. And that was the 14th chapter of Romans that we concluded last time. And we made it all the way through the first 14 verses of Romans 14. So today I want to invite you to open your Bibles as we begin to the book of Romans, the 14th chapter. And I want to pick our study up in the 15th verse today, Romans chapter 14 and verse 15. It says, but if thy brother is grieved with thy meat. Now, let me take time for a little quiz. What does that word meat mean? It means food. What's the word it comes from? It's not plop, plop, fizz, fizz. It's not Alka-Seltzer. It's bromo-seltzer. The Greek word is bromo that we get bromo-seltzer from. And so it's talking about food. And he says, this is important, if your brother is grieved with your food, now walkest thou not 
charitably or with love. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Notice what this is talking about. This is not saying you can or should eat certain things. It is actually saying you should not eat certain things because it will offend your brother. But more than that, it says in here that he would be destroyed. We could kill someone by the food we eat. You know, we all know that we can kill ourselves with our own food. We often heard that term, we dig our graves with our teeth. But we can also cause another to be destroyed by insisting on eating certain things that offend that brother. And that's what I want us to look at today. Can one really be lost or destroyed over the issue of food. Take your Bibles now, keep your finger here in Romans, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Paul says, But take heed, lest thy means, by any means this liberty of yours should become a stumbling block to them that are weak. He said, we have liberty. We can do certain things. And we saw as we studied uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's talking about eating things sacrificed to idols. We know that there is only one God, but he says there are others that have not that knowledge, if you remember our study. And if they see you eat something sacrificed to an idol, their weak conscience might be harmed by you eating it, even though we know an idol is nothing. So we got to notice here what he says. Now drop down just a little bit here in verse 11. He says, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother, what? Perish for whom Christ died. That's an awesome thought. That we could eat something that there's nothing wrong with it, something sacrificed to an idol, but an idolater who believes that idol is a real God and we eat from it, or somebody who has come out of idolatry who still does not have a clear understanding of the gospel can be lost because you've cast a stumbling block in front of him by eating something that has offended him. He will perish. Look at verse 12. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, what do you do? You sin against Christ. So not only are you sinning against that person, but you are sinning against Christ who gave his life for that person. Now verse 13, he kind of pulls it together and he switches the words too. Wherefore, if meat, bromo, food... Make my brother to offend, I will eat what? No flesh. You see, now he goes into flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. He says, if that weak brother is offended by the food I eat, then I would rather eat no flesh at all than to take the chance on offending him, thinking that animal had been sacrificed to some god. That's what the whole issue is. It's not saying it's free for you to go eat whatever you want to eat. It says just the opposite, that even if something is acceptable for food, you should not eat it if it will cause somebody to be offended, stumble, and perish. You see, not only will people be lost by what they eat, but people will be lost by what we eat if we are not sensitive to our weaker brothers and sisters. Remember, the sin in Eden was over food. That was the first great temptation on this earth. Oh, take a bite. One little bite. I've heard people say, well, God's not particular. I think one bite of one piece of fruit is very particular. I really do. And by the way, the problem in the 
garden was not the apple, it was the pear. P-A-I-R. The first temptation that Jesus faced on the Mount of Temptation was over food. Turn these stones into bread. And I believe that the great temptation for God's people in these last days is going to be appetite also. It will be food again. Go back to Isaiah for a moment. All the way back, 700 years before the time of Jesus, Isaiah chapter 65. And I want to read in Isaiah 65 a couple of verses, a few, few passages here. First of all, look at verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walk in the way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoke me to anger continually and to my face that sacrifice in gardens and burn incense upon altars of brick. Notice now which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself and come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose of fire that burns all the day. Is God pleased or displeased here? You see, there was a problem with some of the folk back in ancient Israel, and Isaiah addressed the issue directly. But as you read this, as you should all passages of Scripture, see what applications might be here for us today. You see, there is a modern application to this, I believe. What people today provoke their God to anger continually that sacrifice, that burn incense, that remain among the graves, that lodge in monuments, that eat swine's flesh and abominable things and say, I'm holier than you are. Let me break it down for you quite slowly here as we look at this. They provoke God continually to anger how they sacrifice still. You ever heard of a thing called the Mass? What is the Mass? It's a sacrifice. They sacrifice them anew every day, over and over. That burn incense. Do they burn incense? Go and see. That remain among the graves. This is an interesting phraseology. Do you know what makes a cathedral a cathedral? There's dead people in it. St. Peter's Basilica is called St. Peter's Basilica because St. Peter is supposedly buried down underneath that thing with a whole bunch of other dead folk. Matter of fact, I don't know if any of you saw the email that was circulating how Pope Francis went down into that tomb under St. Peter's to pray for Ellen White in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They... It says, remain among the graves or the cathedrals. They lodge in monuments. It's one of the things interesting about this new pope. He refuses to lodge in the Vatican there at St. Peter's. He stays in the hotel room that he used to stay in when he was a cardinal. I don't know how long that's going to go on. But they do lodge in these great monuments around the world. They do eat swine's flesh and abominable things. And if you don't think that they say, I'm holier than you are, then you must understand that they think that you are condemned and you're damned because you are not one of them. So there are some modern implications here that we ought to be aware of when we look at this. But I want you to see, because people often say, oh, well, that was just back there. But let's go a little bit further. Flip into chapter 66 now the 66th chapter, and look at verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind 
to render his anger and with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by the sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. What event is this talking about? Second coming. It's not talking about something in Isaiah's day. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus. Now watch. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. When Jesus comes, people will still be eating these things and it says that they will be destroyed. Are there foods that will kill? You better believe there are foods that will kill. You know, a friend of mine once said, years and years ago, he was an evangelist, uh, and he said he always wondered why God said swine's flesh and the mouse and put them together there. But he was a missionary for years and years in South America, and he said uh, in his earlier days down there in South America, he was riding one of the mail trains that stop at every little town going down through there. And at one of the stops, he said, there was a lot of noise and festivity going on outside. And, and so since the train was stopped, he just went ahead and stepped outside to see what was going on along the side of the train station there. And there was a fiesta going on. That, by the way, I have two favorite Spanish words, fiesta, siesta. I love those two. But there was a fiesta going on out there. And Roger said that he looked and he was amazed that they had these pigs. And there, all of us have seen pictures of them with apples in their mouths and laying there. But also laid out beside of them were rats. Roasted rats. And you paid for the rat based upon the length of its tail. The swine and the abomination and the mouse when Jesus comes back. These were things that we were told here. And so even when he comes, these rebels will still be found and food will still be an issue. But let's go back to Romans again now. Romans 14, verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You see, why are we not careful about these type of things? For he that in these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. The kingdom of God is righteousness, not unrighteousness, my friend. It is peace not war and conflicts. It is joy, not anger and disputes. He tells us what we should be striving to do. And I want to present to you today that a calloused Christian is as much a contradiction of terms as a cold sun. As my grandfather would say, there ain't no such thing. The purpose of the sun is to shed the warmth of which it is composed. And so the purpose of the Christian is to diffuse the peace and joy and love which has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And only those who thus serve Christ are acceptable to God. Remember, the kingdom of God is righteousness, it said. Righteousness is obedience to the law, for all unrighteousness is sin. And sin is the transgression of the law. Just common logic, friends. This shows very clearly that forbidden foods or the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is not even under consideration as one of those things of personal opinions or 
doubtful disputations. He goes on in verse 20, and he says, For meat or food, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eats with offense. Evil to eat with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby your brother stumbles and is offended or is made weak. So instead of what many try to say is that this says you can eat anything you want, God says, no, you're better off not to eat things, even acceptable things, if they're going to do harm. We talked a little bit in the Sabbath school in there this morning about how some Christians eat and drink differently based upon whose presence they are in. Some Seventh-day Adventists, even ministers, eat and drink differently when they're in the presence of certain people. They don't realize that they cast a stumbling block before their congregations. They don't realize that they're casting stumbling blocks before one another. There are many things, my friends, that are allowable that are not, however, necessary. If we are seeking to help a brother or a sister who has a weak, uninstructed faith, it would be far better to have charity toward that person, even though his or her scruples are devoid of reason, than it is to wound him or her and cause them to stumble and fall and be lost. The lesson is not that it is better to do something, but rather it is better not to do rather than offend. Take the scriptures for what they teach, not for what we want to make them say. In verse 22, he says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he allows. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Do you see how strong this is as he brings it down to the end? My friends, for one to weakly comply with the judgment of others rather than acting from strong personal conviction is in itself sin. When you take part in anything feeling it is wrong, it is sin. We mentioned today in the class in there, when a person says, I know I shouldn't do this, but that is sin. I know I shouldn't eat this, but it is sin. I know I shouldn't go there, but it is sin. I know I shouldn't wear this, but you see what I'm saying? Scripture says we must be true to our conscience, to our convictions. The thing presented from the beginning of this 14th chapter of Romans is the case of a man with so little real knowledge of Christ that he thinks righteousness is to be obtained by the eating of certain kinds of food or by not eating other types of food. The idea clearly conveyed by this entire chapter, however, is that it is by faith and not by eating and drinking that we are saved. This chapter does not in any way teach that God has now changed his mind about what is and is not to be eaten, and what was once forbidden has now been altered in direct defiance of his word, and that it's now acceptable. Oh yeah, he said that back then, but it doesn't mean anything today. But remember Psalm eighty-nine, thirty-four: My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Either it is the same as it always was. Are you ready for this? 
or God is a liar. Now you choose which one of those you want to believe. But let no man call God a liar. Neither did this passage of Scripture teach that the Sabbath or any other commandment of God can be disregarded at one's pleasure, but rather it is inspired instruction in Christian courtesy and compassion. And we must all come to understand for ourselves that conscience is between the individual and God alone. Don't seek to be conscience for another human being. You know, I had, I want to interject some here. I had a woman write to me from California some time back really condemning me for a position I took on something and she went on to say that she's just glad that she was there to be conscience for me. Well, I may not have feathers, but mine got ruffled. She backstroked the cat. And I wrote her back a letter telling her that I appreciated her offer, but I thought that I would just continue on with the faulty, defective conscience that God had given me, and she could try to work on somebody else. Fortunately, I have good elders in this church, and I ran that letter by a couple of my elders, and they said, Pastor, don't mail it. So I've still got it. She never got to hear my concern about her generous offer. Do not... Think that you can be conscience for another human being. We are never at liberty to impose our freedom of conscience upon another, but are at times even required to refrain from exercising our freedom out of consideration for others. In other words, if we are able to walk fast, we are to help the weaker brother or sister who is going the same way, only a little more slowly. Don't run off and leave them. I got my oldest daughter, those that know her, she's one long-legged blonde Amazon. And when I go places with her, uh, I have to sprint to keep up with her. And uh, I used to tell her, even before I had the new parts that have slowed me down, that when she got there, just be sure and write and let me know how it is or to save me a place because she went very fast. She finally, after a long, long time of encouraging, understood that I wanted her to walk with me and not run off and leave the old man way back in the back somewhere. We walk with one another and we help one another in the walk that we are doing. But we are, while doing that, never ever to turn out of the way to please someone who is walking the wrong way. So in summation, I want to leave you with just a few Bible verses here to quickly look at. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to let the Word of God sum this up. 12th chapter of Romans, first two verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your... God, never ask anything unreasonable of you. Which is your reasonable service. And here it comes. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now go to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Is God particular? And then go to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. 
Chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. May God bless each of you. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 310.